All right, hello everybody. Um, for this lecture, we'll be talking about radioactivity. Um, radioactivity. I have a stylus now, so uh, hopefully things get more legible, although I guess <laughs> that, that particular piece might not be. Um, but so we're going to ask ourselves a couple of uh, a couple of questions here, uh, or one motivating question, which is: How often do radioactive? Uh, how often do decays, radioactive decays, occur? Decays occur. Um, so suppose you were to sit down and watch a number of atoms, um, and as you watch these atoms, some of them disintegrated or they, they turned into other, or so, as you watch these nuclides, some of the nuclides changed into other nuclides and decayed. Um, and you recorded as a function of time how many atoms had gone through uh, this decay process. Well, if you did that, you would notice that the um, that the decay curves that the curve the number uh, of atoms that decayed per unit time so let's say the oops so the number of atoms that occurred big N that occurred per unit time uh, let's call T down here and let's say this is in seconds um, it would look like an exponential decay. So if up here we started at um, if we started at some value n sub naught, our initial conditions, um, you would notice that this would look like a decay curve. Let me try to draw that a bit better. Um, uh, and at some time. Oops, let me give myself a little more breathing room and make that a little more shallow. So, do to do. First one. So I'm exacerbating it, but um, at some point, um, right about here maybe. So this is where. Um, we have half and not, uh, we have half of, um, of the of initial comp the initial concentration or the initial number of atoms and not. So let's call that and let's say from, you know, T we'll say from T, from T naught where T naught exists to this point, we've got some amount of time in there, right? So that's some unit of time. Um, and let's call that delta t, for, for instance, okay? If we went and we looked at another delta t away, um, so the same amount of time here, we went up this decay curve, um, I'm gonna modify what this looks like. Oops, a bit. I'm gonna grab the eraser here just to make this look a little better. Um, we would notice that at this time, this two delta t over here, uh, uh, in um, in this area, uh, the n naught or the value that we have is actually now n naught over four. So at one delta t, oops, one delta t, we have half and. At two delta t, we have a quarter, and at three delta t, we would have an eighth, etc. Um, 
And so after a certain amount of time, uh, we have half the amount of material that was left. Um, and so, uh, or of the original mass. And so this is, uh, this kind of half time value is what we call the half life, or that's, uh, that's how it's known. So, um, more formally, let's say, oops, let's call uh, t of one half, t sub one half, which has units of seconds, uh, So this has units of seconds and is called the half-life, right? So it represents, um, if you go one half-life, you now have half of the amount of material that you originally started with. Uh, and so for purposes of nuclear engineering, these half-lives are sort of fundamental physical constants. They don't really change with the environment. You can go halfway across the universe and the half-life of uranium-235 is gonna be the same as it is uh, back here on Earth. Um, and what it really depends on is that parent nuclide. So I'll add that to the, this here. Right, so um, it's not necessarily uh, something that changes. There are some physical situations and very extreme uh, manufactured conditions, but we're not gonna get into any of that. Um, so consider that the half-lives are parent nuclide, or, par or sorry, physical constants that depend on the parent nuclide. Um, so uh, if we go through a number of half-lives, we'd expect the amount available, or sorry, if we go through three half-lives, um, just as an example, for three half-lives, um, we would expect the function, let me do this, n, if n is our function of time, oops, n of three, t one half is equal to n naught, our original mass, times, oops, times one half times one half times one half. Um, and so on. So four, uh, which is equal. Oops. So this is equal to, uh, of course, um, uh, one half. Oops. To the third times and not. Um, and so it's easy to see what's going on if you have n of four t, oops, t one half, then this is equal to one half to the fourth of the initial mass, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, um, thus, like extrapolating this, um, we can say that um, n of, whoops, at any time is equal to um, the initial mass and not times one half to the t, or time, divided by the number of half-lives. 
that it's been through, or divided by t one half. So let me try to write that a little better. Um, oops. <laughs> T divided by the, so the time divided by T one half or our half life, um, right? So the the fractional number of half lives that we've gone through, you take that as the exponent to one half t multiplied by the uh, initial mat, initial number of atoms. Okay, um, and that's how many atoms that you have left. Um, we can rearrange this, of course, so we can say that this is equal to, um, and not again, times two to the negative, two to the negative one, uh, oops, t divided by t one half, Um, let me redo that. T divided by T one half. Um, and this in turn is equal to, um, uh, we can bring the negative out of the exponent here, so we can say that this is equal to the initial mass, uh, or the initial atoms times, oops, two negative t divided by t one half. Okay, all right. Um, so then, by some log rules, we know that, or we can change how we're going to express this, and so we can say, or we know that the number two, oops, <laughs> um, we know that the number two is in fact, if we wanted to do this, is equal to e to the natural log of two, right? So e to the natural log is it's, is the base itself again. And so we can substitute this in, and we can say that n of t is equal to, um, the initial number of atoms and not times oops, um, times e to the natural uh, log of two um, and this whole thing to the negative uh, to the negative t time over the half-life, okay? Now again, by log rules, um, we can take <laughs> uh, this out and this all just becomes uh, n naught e to the negative t time natural log of two over the uh, the half-life. Now, we're going to define the variable lambda as nat the natural log of two uh, over t one half, because that's and that's what's called a decay constant, and um, is effectively uh, or is also a physical constant because it's just based on the nat the natural log of two over uh, the half-life. So. The t way this is typically written, oops, is n naught e to the negative uh, lambda 
um, lambda t. That's right. Um, with oops, lambda here. This is a decay constant, or what's called a decay constant, and it has units of one over seconds, um, which makes it a. So you can think of it kind of like a frequency. Okay, just has units of one over second, um, and it's a physical constant based on the half life. Um, so uh, that's pretty useful. Uh, but we can derive this expression in another way. So this is kind of the intuitive. If you sat down and watched things, um, uh, you would. If you sat down and watched atoms decay, this is the aggregate behavior that you would observe, which is pretty cool. Um, but you can also say that um, suppose we have a mass uh, uh, or a number of atoms. Evolving at a certain rate. A certain rate lambda. Okay. Um, in this case, we would write down the differential equation um, that, oops, <laughs> uh, that the change in the number of atoms, dn dt, so the, the time rate of change of the number of atoms, um, is equal to negative lambda times um, uh, the number of atoms, right? So at every time step, we have a number of atoms that is uh, lambda times the number of atoms less than what we started with. So this is a relatively simple differential equation. So let's go about solving that. So the first thing that we do is we want to bring all the n's to one side and bring the t's over. And so to solve this, we would simply say dn, uh, oops, dn over n is equal to negative. Oops, that's not what I want. Negative lambda. negative lambda times dt. And then to solve for this, we would integrate. Um, from here, we would integrate from time zero to, um, uh, to time t. Uh, and uh, then after that, we would integrate from, on the other side, we would integrate from, uh, oops, don't know why it's freaking out, from, our initial condi condition n at time zero or n not um, to n of time t. And if you wanted to be really formal about this, these would be little t primes, okay? And so this implies, whoops, that the natural log, so when you integrate this, dn over n is the natural, integrates to the natural log of n evaluated at big N of zero at big N of t to big N of t um, equals uh, negative lambda t evaluated at from zero to uh, zero to time t. Um, or yeah, and so uh, when we do that, let's plug in all these values. So bringing this over here, <laughs> nope. Wow, someone doesn't like me. So bringing this over there, um, the natural, uh, we get the natural log of n of t 
minus the natural log of n naught. Oops. equals um, negative lambda t plus zero. And so um, using our log rules, we can divide these one by another. Um, and so we end up with the expression um, the natural log of n of t divided by n naught equals oops, equals negative no, lambda t. And at this point, all we have to do is take the exponential. So let's move on to the next page. Take the exponential of both sides. So that means we're just left with n of t divided by n naught on the left equals, oops, no. <laughs> New stylus, I'm still getting used to. e to the negative lambda t, um, and then if we bring n naught over, we see that we have the same expression. n of t e equals uh, equals n naught e e to the negative lambda t, and so. Um, what I've shown you now are two ways to derive this relationship for radioactive decay. So if you have a certain species, after a number of, um, after a certain amount of time, uh, you'll have, if you have n not atoms initially, you'll get n of t atoms, uh, given that you know what the half-life is. Okay? And you, or, you, or you know what the decay constant is. You want either one, and you can compute the other. So, okay, so a related unit is what we'll call, uh, to the decay, is what we'll call activity. Okay, um, and activity is uh, defined as the number of disintegrations per second. Integrations per second. Okay. Um, so typically we represent the activity with the letter alpha. I know we're representing alpha particles as alpha, but they, the context should never overlap. And so um, this is the number of, uh, or this, so we'll just say that this is the number of atoms that you have multiplied by the decay constant itself. Um, so this is this is uh, alpha of t is equal to uh, oops lambda times uh, uh, the relative number density. So this is not the number of atoms, but the uh, number density. So this is n, little n of t, um, which is then equal to, oops, you have an initial activity of alpha naught um, lambda oops, e come on e to the negative lambda 
lambda t. Okay. Um, all right. So that's what the that's how you can compute the activity. This is measured in units of curies or CI. So if you see that, this is obviously named after um, Marie Curie. Um, and we know, and this is particular, and it's defined as um, one, one Curie. Oops. One Curie is equal to three oops point seven oops times ten to the ten uh disintegrations per second. Operations per second. Okay. So this is the traditional unit for this. The SI unit is the Becquerel. Um, so lots of nuclear engineers like Curry's, but uh, the standard unit um, Becquerel, abbreviated BQ, um, and this is, and one Becquerel is one disintegration per second. So it's much smaller. So one Becquerel equals one disintegration per second, um, which is equal to 2.7 um, 3 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, curies. Okay. Um, so the reason why we're talking about Becquerel and Curie's and activity in the first place is that this is related to um, how much dose and exposure someone has to radiation. Um, and this is covered more in later chapters in the book and is sort of a big topic in, in, in health physics. Um, or that's kind of their main metric. And it's all related based on this sort of fundamental, these fundamental physical constants. So. Um, uh, the mean lifetime, uh, so another quantity of note is uh, the mean lifetime tau, um, or sometimes capital tau in the book, but more traditionally tau, uh, lowercase tau. The mean lifetime, so this is how long something, how long a material is going to be around. Um, uh, uh, tau. Uh, this is defined. Uh, oops. So tau is equal to one half. Oops, sorry. All right. So it's tau is equal to. It is the inverse of the decay constant. So it's one over lambda, um, and this is. Because of that, it is equal to oops, t one half over the natural log of two, or oops, this is approximately equal to one point four four. Oops times the half-life. So it's about 44% longer than the half-life. So this is um, uh, 
how long a particular uh, it's the expectation value of how long an atom can expect to be around is about 40 percent 44 percent longer than the half-life um, okay so um, given this we can write down a little table that says um, let's go ahead and carve this up so oops. so if we have t one half here and if we say that t one half uh, is um, infinite so if we say our half-life is infinite or it's zero actually let me draw a better infinity so it's either um, infinite or zero so if that's true um, our case for lambda so lambda is defined as the natural log of 2 over t1 half so if our half-life is infinity um, right so if we have uh, then our t1 half it, or sorry our half-life is, in, is infinite our uh, decay constant is zero similarly if our uh, if our half-life is zero then our decay constant is infinite um, and we have different names for these different cases so um, if we if we want to talk about the stability so when the half-life is infinite that means it never decays and so um, we call that a stable nuclide right it will never decay it's always it always it, it always is what it is now if the half-life is zero that means it instantly decays and so it doesn't exist <laughs> Because any time it comes into existence, it would instantly go away. And the space in between, between zero and infinite, um, which we can add as a separate column. So we'll say uh, less than infinity, um, but greater than zero. Uh, this would be uh, greater. Uh, this is greater than zero um, and uh, the term for this is unstable so it might exist but it's going to be not necessarily around in uh, huge quantities okay well that's it for our first lecture or lecture on radioactivity um, and I'll see you guys or you'll see me again next time. Thanks a lot.